<laughs> this talk is sort of backwards. I gave a talk, uh, I guess, a week or two ago on virus mutations and uh, the vaccines that had been approved. And given some of the conversation, it seemed appropriate maybe to go back and give this talk on virus basics and coronavirus specifically as a background. And I apologize because of the fact that I'm giving them backwards. Last time I volunteered at the last minute mm -hmm. because I got a bug about preparing a slide about vaccines. This time Don volunteered me at the last minute <laughs> and I foolishly said yes, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> As I, as I mentioned, I gave this talk back, I think, in mid-March of now last year, and uh, I updated it and changed it quite a bit since then. And so some of the slides are the same, but a lot of them are modified, and a good number of them are very different. And so is the focus in some areas of the talk itself. But in any event, I'm going to start very basically with the next slide, please. Uh, no, you, you had the right one about <laughs> that one. OK, that Sorry. one. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, what are viruses and is it a form of life? or an organic structure. And that's still something that's being debated, mostly because it's both. If it's outside a cell, it's really not called a virus, it's called a virion. And it's a very small inert organic particle. Inside a living cell is when it becomes a virus and an active infectious agent. And it has all kinds of hosts that can provide those living cells, animals, plants, and microorganisms. And basically how a virus becomes an active infectious agent is by hijacking the host cell's reproductive mechanism and making a whole lot of copies of itself in an infected cell. It then breaks that cell and a whole bunch of new copies are released as virions until they find a new host cell and the cycle keeps going. Next slide. Okay. All right, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but uh, the discovery is fairly new. It all happened at the end of the 1800s in a very short period of time. And the whole process happened because a French microbiologist invented Oh, sorry. There. In, invented a filter. Uh, and a couple of Russians and Dutch uh, researchers used those filters to determine that there were things smaller than bacteria that could act as pathogens or infectious agents. And the first one was what we now know to be the tobacco mosaic virus. And then a few years at the same time, uh, a couple of, uh, I think they were French, if I remember, they used the same kind of filter to isolate the first animal virus. So plant virus, animal virus discovered at the same time. And that's enough of that. Next slide, please. Oh. Uh, the other thing that was interesting, wrong direction, Lou. Oh, what? <laughs> the other thing that was interesting was the word virus itself. That's been around for a long time. It's actually from the Latin word for poison, but it, you, it became to mean an infectious agent um, in the late 1700s. But even then, it didn't have the current meaning. It really was an infectious agent in the case of like a venereal disease. 
So people knew that venereal disease was infectious, but they had no clue what caused it. And so it, it really wasn't until the late 1800s that virus started to mean what it means today. All right, the origins. There's a whole bunch of competing theories, and I'm not going to go into them. If you want copies of the slides, um, Don and Lou have them, and they'll be happy to forward them to them to you. But the important thing about this slide is that viruses infect archaea, which are a three billion year old life form that lives on in volcanic vents. And so basically viruses have existed at least since the evolution of living cells, since these archaea are assumed to be among the oldest, if not the oldest of life forms. And so they've been around, viruses have been around for a long time, basically since there have been host cells or very shortly thereafter. Next slide. All right, so now we're starting to get into something significant uh, as far as understanding current virology. Virions, those inert organic particles, have two main parts, a genome, which is a nucleic acid sequence of some kind, and a capsid, which is a protein coat that surrounds and protects the genome. Now the capsid contains many identical units called capsomeres. And if you look at the picture uh, at the left, the real picture, not the drawing, you can see each of those individual units that make up that virus shape. And those are the capsomeres. And then if you look at the picture in the center, you can see the capsid, which is in the center of this picture, surrounded by this sort of fuzzy shaped thing. And that's a lipid membrane envelope. Not all viruses have it, but a lot of them do. And the other thing that's important is the function of the genome is to code for the synthesis of the proteins that make up the capsomere that surrounds the genome and the new copies. And the other interesting thing is that the capsomeres, all of these individual units that protein synthesis makes, self-assemble. This is a new area of interest in engineering, self-assembling molecules. Well, viruses have been doing it for <laughs> 3 billion years, approximately. So there is precedent for the process, is my point. And what you end up with when all of these pieces are self-assembled is a virion with a particular shape called its morphology. Next slide. All right, so morphology uh, has basically three main types or four main types, depending on how you want to count. The simplest one is a genome surrounded by a cylinder formed by essentially a spiral of one type of capsomere. And the classical example is the tobacco mosaic virus, because that's been known for a long time, and that's a little short, rigid rod. But it turns out the Ebola virus has the same structure, except it's really a long cylinder surrounding the, uh, the genome in the center, and it's very flexible as opposed to the rigidity of the mosaic virus. And then you can have polyhedra shapes, and there are some beautiful icosahedral shapes, which I'll show you in a bit. And then if you have lots and lots of capsomere units, 
you can end up with something that looks basically like a sphere. Usually what that takes is two different capsimere types as opposed to an icosahedral or an almost spherical shape that only needs one capsimere shape or type. And then you can have a prolate polyhedron, which is this shape at the top of this complex bacteriophage. And then you can have, so there are some that look just like this head, and then there are complex ones where two shapes stick together. Another interesting thing is that I didn't show any envelopes around here because they're usually spherical surrounding the virus. And what's interesting about the viral envelope that I'm really not gonna point out any place else, so I guess I better do it here, is that that's a co-opted membrane because basically what happens is the virus makes the host cell produce it for the virus because there's nothing that codes for lipids in a virus. And so the only place a lipid membrane can come from is from the host cell itself. And that's pretty interesting in terms of how that happens, but I'm not going to go into any detail here. Next slide, please. So Steve, does that mean that the host cell already has the coding for for creating that lipid and right because the the host cell itself has usually a lipid membrane surrounding it and so the same mechanism that the host cell uses to produce membranes when it divides and makes two cells for example that's what the virus co-opts knows how to co-opt to make a coating for itself because that protective coating is important in certain kinds of host cells to keep the virion around long enough to infect a new cell. And so that's a protective mechanism. And so here, what I'm actually showing are a bunch of transmission electron micrographs. These are the real things. And so here you have a couple of tobacco viruses. You've got a short one, the tobacco mosaic virus, and this is a longer one called a rattles virus, both of tobacco. And then here is that flexible helix of Ebola. So it's got a single genome inside it, and then it's got this helix in this really long shape. And then here is a real picture of an adenovirus that I showed in sort of a an illustration form in the previous slide. And then on the far right is an Epstein-Barr virus, which is a kind of herpes virus, actually. One of the, I think, seven families of herpes virus that exists. Maybe it's nine, I can't remember at the moment. And it also has an icosahedral capsid inside, but it's surrounded by an envelope. But in good pictures, you can still see that the capsid inside the envelope has that icosahedral shape. And then here you have a human papillomavirus, no envelope, and it's starting to look like a sphere because it's got all of these different capsimere units associated with it. And then here you have an influenza virus that has a similar kind of semi-spherical shape, but it's surrounded by an envelope. And then you have a dengue virus where the envelope is so tight to the capsimere that you can see the spherical shape of the capsimere inside the envelope. And then these are two very important pictures. On the far lower right, you have the vi rabies virus. And you can see it's got sort of what's called a bullet or a beehive shape. And that's the characteristic by which the rabies virus is diagnosed when they take a, 
when they take a sample of what they suspect is a rabid animal of some kind. That's what they're looking for. The other one that's interesting is the smallpox virus, but really any pox virus has this kind of shape, and this is called a double hairpin, which is also characteristic of a pox virus. So the point is, this is one of those complicated capsid kinds of shapes inside an envelope that you can find. Next slide. When you say that's what they're looking for when they're looking for rabies, they're not actually looking visually for those things, are they? They have other tests to show that. They're... Yeah, there are, there are other tests, but basically the answer is yes, that's the way they confirm the rabies virus. They actually see it there. You, they actually look for it, usually these days in a scanning rather than a transmission okay. electron microscope. It's lower resolution, but it's easier to prepare the sample. And it's just as good as seeing something like a rabies virus. All right, now the first step in a virus, a virion infecting a cell is to find it. And that's done by basically random motion or diffusion. The virion is tiny and it undergoes Brownian motion. So it randomly wanders around until it runs into something it likes. Then there are things called virion fusion proteins on the surface of either the capsid or the envelope that stick to the host surface cell in a very specific way. And that's what provides what we call host cell specificity. So one virus looks for one kind of host cell in general. There are exceptions that I'll show you later but each virus has adapted over the millennia or millions of years for most of them to be specific for only one kind of host cell. So that's the way it finds a host. But then the next thing is, how does it get inside the host? Because you want the virus genome inside the host to take over the host cell genome to produce more viruses, not more host cells. So there are three mechanisms. And this first one is sort of the classic. And I learned all about it when I was at Caltech because Max Delbrook was doing his pioneering work at the time. And he won the 69 Nobel Prize for his studies of bacteriophages. He, if I remember, he actually did T2 rather than T4 bacteriophages, but that doesn't matter. So this is really a TEM. This is really what one of those bacteriophages looks like. It's big, so you can really see it easily and all of the various structures. But next to that is the schematic that shows it adsorbs to the surface and it gets pinned there and sort of collapses down so it almost looks like a moon lander coming down onto the surface of the cell. And then the whole thing acts like an injection needle and goes squirt and squirts the genome, that little squiggly thing in the head inside the cell where it takes over the host cell mechanism. And that's about as wild if somebody told you that and you didn't know it was true, you would think it was true science fiction. But this was one of the first examples that people used to understand what viruses were all about. And so this was actually one of the first mechanisms, not one of the last ones to be found. So everybody thought this is what they did, you know, to begin with. The other thing that's interesting about this injection mechanism is that even though viruses like a single-stranded RNA virus, um, like that tobacco mosaic virus, um, doesn't look like a plunger, it has a technique 
where it can find special pores on the surface of a host cell and it can inject right from its innards like in that spiral it injects the genome straight through that pore into the host cell so it it still happens even though it doesn't have this plunger mechanism associated with it so this injection method isn't confined to bacteriophages, which is the point I was really trying to make. Next slide. All right, then there's endocytosis, and that's used by most non-enveloped viruses. They're called naked viruses. So just a capsid surrounding the genome. And what happens is the virus particle, the virion gets close to a cell. The cell says, ooh, for some reason or other, it triggers the membrane of the host cell to engulf the virus whole. And then once the virus is inside the host cell, conditions in the cytoplasm usually of the host cell, and it's usually pH, breaks apart the capsid and releases the genome into the host cell where it can take over the host cell mechanism. It's also used by some enveloped viruses in a slightly different way because the enveloped viruses have a membrane of their own. And so what happens is you get attachment on the right panel at the top, and then that attachment triggers a pit to form, just like the pit forms for the non-enveloped virus. And then that pit turns into a bubble, which transfers the virus into the cell, host cell. And then again, pH or some other condition attacks that bubble, breaks the envelope, and then breaks open the capsid inside. And the reason I spent a few seconds on this is because this is the way coronaviruses get into cells. So I'm gonna eventually not talk about it when I get to the coronavirus part, but I want you to remember that that's what coronaviruses and also influenza virus does. And I'm going to use influenza virus and coronavirus sort of in parallel to talk about the life story and evolution of viruses at the end of the talk. Next slide, please. And then the third mechanism, which is used by most enveloped viruses. So that last slide, um, the coronaviruses, that was an exception to the rule. This is what usually happens. And here is the HIV virus, a specific receptor on the host cell binds to a specific point on the virion. And so it's sort of like a lock and key mechanism. And in the case of the HIV virus, there are actually co-receptors and there's CD5 and there's CDX and a whole number of other ones that the HIV virus can use. But it takes that specific binding to then cause the membrane on the outside of the virus to directly fuse with the membrane on the host cell, break the virus open and release the virion into the host cell. All right, so slightly different mechanisms for the three different um, structural, general structural classes of viruses. Next, please. All right, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because it's too complicated, but here again, you can see the bacteriophage life cycle. It penetrates the host cell and sticks its a genome into the host cell. There's synthesis of early proteins by the 
um, co-opted host cell mechanism. The virus gets replicated, then there's a whole bunch of copies um, of the pieces, four copies. The late stage proteins assemble those pieces into copies of the intact virus. Those particles are released when the host cell breaks and now you've got new variants floating around looking for host cells. And that host cycle from start to finish can, for bacteriophages can be as short as 15 minutes at essentially body temperature. So it can be very fast. When we get to the coronavirus slides, you'll see that it takes about six hours for the life cycle of a coronavirus. And over on the right, you can see a much more complicated version of this particular life cycle, showing the fact that you have RNA that goes to DNA and DNA makes proteins and the proteins assemble. And there's all kinds of other proteins involved in that process. And then eventually what has to happen is the reverse of the way the virus enters the cell. It has to get out of the cell. And so there's a mechanism for that, which also can involve co-receptors on the inside of the cell membrane of the host cell that says, let me out. And in the case of influenza, even though the, and this is a good picture of it, even though the influenza virus gets out, it gets stuck to the host cell on the outside. So all these copies that get made, get out through the membrane, they get stuck on the membrane, and then another mechanism actually cleaves the thing that's holding them onto the membrane so that they get released. So it's really hard to give you sort of a generic diagram that says this works for all viruses because basically almost every virus has its own mechanism. Next slide. So, so Steve, you mentioned some viruses have the lipid envelope, some of them don't, and and I'm, I'm sure at some point you'll talk about how one of the ways we protect against COVID is to destroy the lipid envelope with, you know, soap or whatever. Um, but well, I wasn't going to, but yes, that's, that's the whole point of using detergents with high alcohol content. They basically break that protective lipid coating apart and kill the virus. Okay, but that's that's my question is, some viruses seem to get by without the lipid envelope in the first place, but yet uh, getting rid of the lipid envelope on these other viruses kills it, so to speak, whatever that means, makes it unable to function, I guess. So so what is the what, advantage what, of what, the lipid What's the difference is basically what I think you're asking. Yeah. And the answer is, the part of the virion that the host cell recognizes. In the case of a virion that has an envelope, that recognition mechanism is on the membrane. You get rid of the membrane, there's no recognition of what's left by the host cell and vice versa. Okay, in the case of a capsid without a uh, envelope coating, there are also receptors and um, mechanisms between the host cell and the virus. And you can destroy that mechanism by ruining the coating on the capsid itself. And so in either case, what you're doing is destroying the fusion proteins that get the virion to stick to the host cell. Make sense? I think so. One other All right. question, Steve. Yes, uh, sir. When I saw the first YouTube videos on analyzing COVID, they talked about the reading frames and all that. There were many other proteins made other than just 
to make the mRNA and get it outside the cell. There were, shall we say, defensive proteins to shut down cytokine signaling of the cells so the cell wouldn't notify the cells around it that, in fact, it was affected. In other words, its own antiviral defenses were defeated. Yeah, and, and I'm going to talk it's... a little bit about that later for coronaviruses, Gordon. Okay. Well, I'm going to actually show you the genome and all of the different parts and what they're for. I'm not going to go into as much detail as it sounds that like that YouTube video did, but I'll get close. In any event, I got a lot of slides, so I better keep moving here. All right. So like any other entity, whether we're talking gemstones that I've talked about or meteorites that I've talked about, there are lots of them. And the only way you can sort of understand them and the diseases they cause is to try to figure out some way to organize them because there are millions and millions of different kinds of viruses. Now, the surprising thing is that over 10,000 genomic sequences for viruses are known. The surprising thing is that only 10,000 sequences are known for the millions and millions of different kinds of viruses. But that's because we don't care about most of the viruses. They're just out there. You know, they attack bacteria or algae or who cares what, you know. So basically what we've done is we've sequenced the ones that cause diseases that are important to us, whether those are in animals or in plants or in people, all right? So there have been lots of different ways to try to organize all of these viruses so we can talk about them. By the host organism, all the viruses that attack tobacco plants. By shape, which is sort of stupid when you think about it because that really doesn't mean anything. Uh, the diseases they cause, all of the diseases that cause, or viruses that cause pneumonia. And that's important because you want to distinguish among them when you're trying to decide how to treat a patient. And also by physical characteristics, do they have an envelope, et cetera? That's another sort of stupid one, but it, it has its uses. But the one that's been used for now almost 40 years is called the Baltimore classification system. And it is defined by how, what kind of genome the virus has and how it replicates. Generally, not specifically. And the premise of the Baltimore classification, and he was one of those guys that won a Nobel Prize for his ideas, but the premise is that all viruses have to synthesize positive strand mRNAs from their genomes in order to produce proteins and replicate. So once you accept or understand that that premise is true, then you can talk about replication mode as well as genome type to make all of these different classes. Next slide, please. So here are the seven Baltimore virus groups. And what you see is on the left side, the different kinds of genomes, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, two different kinds of single-stranded RNA, and this positive and negative are apparently when you take a first blush look at them, arbitrary, which one's positive, which one's negative, but they're really not, and they have consequences, as I'll show you a little bit later on. And then you have single-stranded positive with a DNA intermediate in the replication, and then you have what's called gapped double-stranded. And most of those are, especially the last couple, are way too complicated to worry about. 
because you'll hardly ever see uh, groups six and seven. The ones we're going to be concentrating on for the most part are the single stranded RNA groups, as well as a little bit of the double stranded RNA group, because that's where, for example, influenza virus is. It's in this single stranded RNA and things like polio virus are in this single stranded RNA. Um, on the other hand, hepatitis B, which is a fairly common virus, is this gapped double stranded DNA type virus. So they do they are important, and so is HIV as this RNA virus with a DNA intermediate. When I talk about replication steps, though, I'm talking about these replication steps that you see for the seven groups because the specific steps within that generalized replication don't have to be the same. So group one herpes viruses replicate in the cytoplasm of the host cell and make their own proteins. Group one adenoviruses replicate in the nucleus of the host cell and use the host cells mechanism to make its proteins. So it not only, co it co-ops the host cell to do everything for it. So there can be significant differences, but because it replicates in the nucleus, for example, that's why adenoviruses don't have membranes, right? Because the membrane is produced in a different way by the host cell. And I'm not going to go into what that mechanism is. Again, it's not worth it. Next slide. All right, so now we get to the meat of the program here. Here are the viruses in the RNA groups. And you can see we've got group three, four, and five. And I've highlighted the group fours because right down here, coronavirus is listed. So it has an envelope. It has single-stranded RNA as its genome, and it has a helical capsid that surrounds that genome. And here is the influenza virus a little further up. And that influenza virus also has an envelope, also has single-stranded RNA of a different sense, and it has a helical coating. So you can see that there are lots and lots of parallels, which is why I always think of the flu virus and coronavirus sort of as analogous to each other. And I've highlighted in dark and bold some of the other important viruses that you will likely come across and what groups they're in. I've also highlighted all of the group four viruses, even though some of those, like the Norwalk, you'll never run across. Um, but here's polio virus that's in group four, and rhinovirus, which is the common cold virus. Here's hepatitis C and the Zika virus. So a lot of the important viruses that cause lots of the common human diseases are in that group four classification. Next slide. And this is why, or one of the reasons that that sense idea about positive and negative are important. Here is the rate of mutations that accumulate or occur in the various kinds of virus classes from the RNA viruses to the double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, and then here are the bacteria and the higher eukary eukaryotes. But one of the things to see is that sense, because of the replication process, positive sense, coronaviruses 
mutate even faster than the influenza virus. And I think most of you know that the influenza virus has a very high mutation rate, which is why we need new vaccines for it every year. And I'll show you why that happens at the end of the talk. Um, this was an estimate early on for the coronavirus, but every time it has a reproduction cycle, which for coronavirus is about six hours, there are normally six base pair mutations. So it mutates like crazy. The good news for us is that most of those mutations are either unimportant or they don't take. They inactivate the virus so it can't be the virion, so it can't be a virus and invade the host cell anymore. So a lot of that mutation is immaterial, but some of it sticks. And for those of you who heard my talk, <laughs> The previous talk, which should have been a follow on to this one, uh, you can see how important those mutations are. And I'll give you a little information about that in a, in a short while. Next slide. All right, so now let's talk about viruses that we care about. And here is a list of animal viruses that are important to us because they infect food sources, companion animals, and even honeybees. And so arthropods are interesting hosts for viruses because they can be both hosts and vectors. And the classic one that I absolutely love, although both of these are important, is there's something called a varroa mite little itty bitty thing that looks like a, a, a tiny spider. And it's, it hosts the deformed wing virus, even though the mite has deformed wings or wings that are so small you can't tell they're there anyhow. But it's the host for that virus. But that mite infests honeybees. And once it infests the honeybee, it infects the honeybee. The virus jumps from one kind of insect to another. And while it doesn't kill the mite, that mite virus kills the honeybee. And that virus is worldwide and kills lots and lots of honeybees of all kinds around the world. The other thing that's important about these insects viruses is that they're vectors for a particular class of viruses called arborvitus viruses. And so mosquitoes host the Zika virus. They don't get killed by it, but they can infect humans with it. And so that becomes, they become a, a host and a vector for that particular virus. And then there are other types of insect vectors for arboviruses that also infect other vertebrates and also invertebrates. And then I'm not gonna go through this list, but one of them that's important is the pox virus that's specific for rabbits. There was a plague of rabbits in Australia. They were overrunning the country and eating all the grasses for cattle and sheep and all of the native species. And so that particular pox virus was released in Australia in 1950, and it didn't kill all of them, but it killed 99.8 plus percent. And I think it was more like 99.99% .99 of all the rabbits in the country eventually spread like wildfire through the rabbits and killed them all and saved Australia from being overrun. So it was deadly, but useful. And then you have a couple that are important for dogs and cats and felines in general. And this one, the canine distemper virus, it's pretty widespread. It can kill dogs, but it's not that deadly to dogs. 
But in the 1990s, feral dogs that ran wild in Africa spread it to lions. And basically there was almost a complete die off of lions, especially in certain parts of Africa before they got the distemper virus under control by literally vaccinating all the lions that they could find that still were alive. And then of course you can have mutations. So here's a feline virus, which is widespread. Most cats are carriers, but they're immune. But there was a small mutation of the viral capsid and suddenly that virus was able to infect dogs. The dogs had no immunity and it killed lots and lots and lots of them un until that epidemic got under control. And then we have foot and mouth disease, which is really a killer of all sorts of cattle. And then we have pox viruses that mostly infect two breeds, Guernseys and Jerseys. Very strange. <laughs> And then we have blue tongue, which is an arborvirus. So it's carried by an insect vector from host animal to host animal, not within the animal, but from animal to animal. And most, anim most hoofed animals are immune to it. And cattle and or camels in particular are like a reservoir for the virus. The virus spreads within the animal like crazy, but it doesn't hurt it. And so even though you get rid of it and all the other animal hoofed animals that are around, that virus is going to pop up again because it's in camels. And the weird thing about it is, is, is it's deadly to sheep, not deadly to any of these other hoofed animals, but it's deadly to sheep. So viruses have very specific hosts. <laughs> and as you can see, the rule can break down. Doesn't break down often, but viruses can cross from a host species to a new species. Sometimes all the time, as in the case of the deformed wing virus, but sometimes out of the blue, like suddenly a mutation occurs and it's able to do that. Next slide. So now these are human viruses and the diseases they cause. And as you can see, we have a lot of viruses that cause a lot of disease. And we have specific viruses for specific cell types within our body. And most of them are very specific, like the hepatitis viruses. They go for the liver. They don't go for anything else, but they go for the liver. All right, we have all sorts of viruses that go for sexual organs. Herpes viruses of various kinds, HIV, human papillomavirus. But as you can see, under sexually transmitted diseases, there's human papillomavirus. And under skin infections, there's human papillomavirus. And if you look at coronavirus, coronavirus pops up in a couple of places. And cytomegalovirus pops up in a couple of places. And adenoviruses pop up in a couple of places. So most of the time, the virus is cell-specific, but not always. And I'll show you why that's true a little bit later because it depends on the mechanism by which the virus enters a host cell. And in the case of certain coronaviruses, the mechanism or the receptor on the host cell that, it, that sticks the coronavirus to the surface occurs in different tissues, different organs around the body. Next slide. And this is really important for coronaviruses. Anyhow, so here are human viruses that cause respiratory infections, from real simple ones at the top, like the common cold, to 
to what we consider to be serious ones at the bottom, like pneumonia. And you can see a common cause of common colds is coronaviruses. And at the bottom, a less common cause of pneumonia are coronaviruses. And then you can see that adenoviruses can cause really serious disease, but most often they're a less common cause of less important diseases. So it can go both ways. Next slide. All right, so let's talk about coronaviruses now. Where do they come from? Well, first of all, they weren't discovered until the 1960s. And a chicken virus was discovered that turned out to be a coronavirus. But even before that chicken virus, two common cold viruses in humans were found to be coronaviruses. So among, or the actually the first coronaviruses to be discovered of all the coronaviruses were the ones in humans, which is sort of strange. And I'll show you why that's important because even though these are common cold viruses, they can also cause more serious diseases like we saw on that previous slide. They can cause pneumonias and they can kill people, even though we consider them common cold viruses. All right, and so coronaviruses have been discovered in all sorts of animals since then. Now, what I'm, what I'm showing in the, in the center on the left is the taxonomy. And viruses have a taxonomy just like a plant has a taxonomy or animals have taxonomy. It goes order, family, genus. And in a lot of cases in plants and also in viruses, what you have is subfamilies in between family and genus. And then sometimes you have what are called subspecies in a genus and groups of subspecies. So you'll see variation X or variation Y listed along with the genus and the species. And coronaviruses, especially in one of the genuses are like that. And so what it turns out is that alpha coronaviruses basically have bats as co as hosts and they form what's called a, a reservoir you always got bats you always have alpha coronaviruses in those bats same thing with the beta genus they're in bats and so there are two human cold viruses that are alpha genus two that are beta genus. And then you have gamma and delta, and those mostly have birds as reservoirs. Well, if you look not at taxonomy, but at what I'm gonna show you next, uh, don't, go, don't go there yet, uh, Lou, but what I'm gonna show you next is the relationships time-wise among various viruses. How long did it take to go from one kind of family member of coronaviruses to all these different genera, all right? But the point is we can use molecular clocks. We know the approximate time of mutations and how those mutations accumulate. So they form a clock once we have the taxonomy that allows us to understand when particular viruses first emerged and became important. So the assumption because of this group of alpha and to delta virus hosts is that bats and birds 
act as reservoirs for COVID evolution and dissemination. And the viruses co-evolved with the bats and the birds about 300 million years ago. So COVID viruses have been around for a long time. We can use that molecular clock to see the origin of the COVID subfamily pro, pro, what's the word I'm looking for? The original COVID virus that produced all of these different genera. And that common ancestor appeared about 10,000 years ago. And that was the origin of the COVID subfamily. So they're fairly recent in evolution, right? And then the various genera split off somewhere around four to 5,000 years ago, and all in a fairly similar time frame. It took about five to 6,000 years before they split off. Next slide. So we're cursed with a fairly new family of viruses. <laughs> so this is what's called the phylogenetic tree, which is the word I was trying to remember. And this is, a, on the left, you see a traditional tree for the gamma coronaviruses. And I'm not going to try to talk about any of this. But you see that it started out on the left as one virus and then it started to mutate. And as it mutated, it started to form new viruses that became more and more specific for a particular kind of host species and a particular kind of cell in that host species. And so that's what all of these lines are about, how all of these mutations occurred and the length of the lines before the split, if I had a time frame underneath this, would tell you something about the time frame for when all of these splits occurred. So that's a typical phylogenetic tree, sort of an old fashioned one. On the right side, you see the modern trees that we use, not to show all of this detail, but to show like the family tree of humans would be shown. A simplified diagram that says, all right, this is the one we started with, and then we've got all of these branches now. And again, the length of the lines tell you something about when all of these different splits occurred. The interesting thing is that there are four separate lineages for the beta coronavirus family or, or genus. Rather, I, I don't use the words that often to use them properly. Again, not a lot of this is critical, but you'll see some of this same nomenclature used pretty soon. Next slide. All right, so now we're gonna talk about human coronaviruses. And as I said, two of them were first identified in the 1960s and they're called the type species. So for humans, they're the types that we always refer back to, and everything else is relative to them. And they were both first identified in the 1960s, and I don't remember exactly when. And these are the two, human coronavirus 229E and OC43. All right, one's an alpha genus, one's a beta genus. Using that molecular clock, the specific human alpha emerged less than 200 years ago. And it crossed over from a bat of some kind. And we actually know exactly what kind it crossed over from. I think a horseshoe nose bat or something like that. And the beta genus one emerged in 1950, approximately. And it came 
into humans from cattle. And then there are two others, another alpha and another beta. One comes from a mouse. The other one comes from a bat. So again, the alphas usually come from bats. But the betas, the betas have evolved so that there's all sorts of other animals that act as reservoirs from which viruses beta viruses can transfer to humans. And so one of them is from a mouse, but its main co-host, its main reservoir that keeps it going besides in humans are cattle. Now, the important thing about all of these is that some of them are found in very high frequency in humans and cause colds. And you can see 5% of colds for NL63, 15% of colds for 229E, and that's why it was found so early. Because it was realized that there's a virus of some unknown kind that was causing a lot of common colds besides the rhinovirus. And so they isolated and sequenced it to figure out what it was. And as long as they found that one, at the same time, it turned out that the OC43 was causing colds and they isolated it and sequenced it as well. NL63 and Hong Kong U sub one came much later, uh, although they probably are older than the upper ones, especially H. Well, I take that back. HK is probably a new one as well. So I, I guess the first one to emerge was probably the H, the 229E. In any event, you can see that I've listed what the receptor is what the binding mechanism to the human respiratory system is for each of these viruses. And the interesting thing is that NL63 binds to the ACE2 receptor. That's the same receptor as the virus, coronavirus, that causes COVID-19. So there are already known coronaviruses that have jumped from animals and learned how to bind to that receptor in humans. So when people say it had to be made in a lab and all the rest of it, when they're talking about COVID-19 virus, doesn't have to be that way. It's already happened. All right. The other thing that's interesting is this sialoglycan receptor that a couple of these um, coronaviruses use. And that's interesting because that's what influenza A virus uses to get into human respiratory cells. It uses a sialoglycan receptor. And so viruses transferring from animals to humans by way of adaptation to our sialoglycan receptor is again a very common occurrence. It even happens in coronaviruses. And it's happened very recently in the Hong Kong virus. Next slide. Now there have already been two coronaviruses that cause really severe disease all the time in humans. The first one em that emerged was first reported and identified in 2002. And it's why our COVID virus for COVID-19 is not called SARS because 
this one at the top is the one that's commonly called SARS. And we don't bother to, rec to say it's a COVID virus. And that causes severe acute respiratory syndrome. It came from a Rufus horseshoe bat, but it's got a lot of co-hosts, including domestic cats. But the one that probably got it to cross over to humans was the palm civet, because that sold as bushmeat in a lot of different Chinese markets. And so the virus was in the civets, and people ate a lot of civet, and eventually the virus figured out how to jump across to humans. And look what it does. It binds to the ACE2 receptor. So again, there's precedent, not a very old precedent, but there's precedent for a virus jumping from a bat to humans and adapting to the ACE2 receptor. The other one that came along, came along in 2012, and you can see both of these are beta genus. And again, bat origin, this one's probably more than a thousand years old in bats, but it jumped to humans in 2012. And both of these viruses are worldwide and persistent, although MERS is very, very low probability of human to human transmission, but it's got a host reservoir in camels. It loves camels for some reason or other. <laughs> and there's lots of camels in the Mideast. And so they're constantly a little tiny mini outbreaks that are easily controlled because it has such a low probability of human to human transmission. But if you eat a camel, there's the possibility you could get MERS. And it's spread around even in countries that don't have camels. It's known to have been in 27 countries only 2,500 cases in humans, but it killed most of them, or at least a lot of them. It killed almost a third of them. So it was very deadly, but the good news is that it wasn't very transmissible in humans. Same thing was true for SARS. It spread to 37 countries, only 8,000 cases, but again, very high mortality and mostly in the elderly. All right, enough of that one. Next slide. The interesting thing is that these are the genomes for those two viruses. This is what happens when you translate that genome into proteins. And here now, Gordon, on this slide, you can see all the different pieces. The pieces that are structural down at this end, but there are also pieces down at the right end of this genome that are responsible for assembly and a whole bunch of other functions. And then over on the left side, you can see an interferon antagonist, and a whole bunch of other areas that are associated with replication and uh, cell entry and exit and all of these other um, functions that the virus has to go through in order to protect itself both inside the host cell and outside the host cell. The interesting thing to remember, even though these two genomes look almost exactly the same for these two viruses, is that these viruses have different receptors. Can you go back one, Lou? So 
SARS receptor is the ACE2 receptor. MERS enters by DPP4, which is a totally different enzyme that helps regulate glucose levels, while the ACE2 receptor is an enzyme that helps regulate blood pressure. So two totally different receptors and actually in two totally different parts of the body even though they both both cause respiratory disease. Next slide. All right, so these spike proteins, which are the parts that stick the virus to the cell, have different shapes because they are specific for different human receptors in order to ca cause entry into the host cell and then cause disease. All right, and if we look, here is, you see the S and the picture up on the upper right for the two? That's the genome, and it looks almost the same size for those two viruses. It's about 2,500 base pairs. Next slide. Now we get to, to COVID-2, as it's called or really SARS-CoV-2, because it also causes a severe respiratory disease. The first case was identified in November of 2019 in China, but studies suggest that it was actually around as early as September. And it's zoonotic, it jumped from animals to humans, and it was a two-step process. It started out in bats, as most beta genus coronaviruses do, but then somehow it infected pangolins. And they're from Indonesia, but they're, again, bushmeat in Chinese market, and they also have supposed medicinal properties and so they're a very common animal that gets imported from Indonesia into China to the point where they're actually becoming endangered in their native habitat. But in any event, the bat genome got mixed with the pangolin genome in the pangolins, and then it became zoonotic. It jumped from its animal host to humans. And once it was in humans, it adapted further by mutation to become an even more effective virus as far as the virus was concerned and to cause a more serious disease in humans and become very easily transmitted from humans to humans. All right, and so again, here we have a beta genus coronavirus for humans that enters by the ACE2 receptor. Next slide. One of the things I wanted to stress, and this was new versus that first uh, talk that I gave last year, is that even though COVID-2 enters the body via the respiratory system, there are ACE2 receptors everywhere in the body. And here what you've got is a chart that lists where the ACE2 receptors are, which organs and the cell or tissue type in that organ that contains a lot of ACE2 receptors. And so I'm not just talking about a random ACE2 receptor here or there. I'm talking about a lot of receptors that are targets or at least can be host cells for the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And that's why you see strokes in the brain. And that's why you see heart problems. And that's why you see kidney problems. And that's why you see gut problems. 
And that's why it can interfere with reproduction. And so one of the things that happens is it basically gets into the blood from the respiratory system through the blood exchange in the lung. And then all of our blood vessels have epithelial cells that contain lots of ACE2 receptor. And so by going from cell to cell in the bloodstream, it travels everywhere it wants to in the body and eventually infects all of our organs until it gets to one that kills us. And so we don't usually die from pneumonia when we have COVID, although we can, and a lot of people do, but you also see listed on the death certificate in many cases, even if there wasn't an underlying condition, you'll see heart attack, you'll see stroke, and both COVID and that will be listed on the death certificate. And that's one of the things that appears to have confused our dear leader. He sees heart attack on a death certificate and says, it's not really caused by COVID, you're counting too many. I'm not killing that many people. <laughs> like one or two here and there makes a difference. All right, next slide, please. And then finally, Gordon, here is the genome for COVID-2. And you can see that it's got the same open reading frames that were in COVID for SARS and COVID for MERS. And they basically, those open reading frames have the same general function. The open reading frame one has the enzymes for protein production. Reading frame two has the enzymes for viral transcription and replication. And then over here in the green on the right side are what are called accessory proteins. And those are used for assembling the, the copies of the virus inside the cell. And then here on the bottom in this diagram, you can see the, where the structural proteins occur in the virus itself. You've got the spike protein. You've got the inner capsid proteins. And you've got these little proteins that hold the membrane together. And so even though the lipid membrane itself is produced by the host cell, the virus produces a little tiny protein that holds the pieces of membrane that are produced together for its envelope because otherwise the envelope wouldn't fit. If it was just the envelope for the host, you'd have a giant envelope with a little tiny virus inside. So the membrane is made in pieces. The host cell assembles it the same way the virus assembles it. It takes those pieces and binds them together with little proteins. All right, enough of that. But again, Gordon, you see the general picture of how this works between the previous genome picture and this one. Each one has slightly different details. Again, the important thing is here you have a spike protein that has the right shape to stick to a receptor, the ACE2 receptor, on the surface of the host cell in our bodies. Next slide. So, this talks a little bit about that rapid mutation. What you have originally is a virus that infected China. And so it's that blue one, that big circle over on the right. It infected China. But even that first mutation or that first genome 
which was identified and sequenced in about the end of December, started mutating like crazy to produce this phylogenetic tree. And so by the end of February, you have all of these different dots, which represent all of the different strains of virus that are similar in the sense that They've accumulated mostly the same mutations, but they might have one different one or two different ones. And so each of these little packets at the end of February is called a clade. And there were three main clades or strains at the end of February. There was the original Chinese one, and it actually traveled from China straight to the west coast of the United States. That strain produced a different clade, B, and that's the one that spread into East Asia, Southeast Asia in particular, India, Thailand, and also went to places like Australia. And then you have C, which got somehow one of these other clades got to Iceland. Once it got to Iceland, it mutated. And that mutation was found in Iceland, but then it traveled back from Iceland to Europe. And also that's the one that caused the big outbreak in New York and New Jersey on the East coast of the US. So it got back to Europe and it caused all hell to break loose in Spain and Italy originally, and then spread to the rest of Europe and spread to the East Coast. Next slide. And for those of you who are real gluttons, each of these dots represents a sample from a human that was collected and then the genome was sequenced. So there's about 2,500 of these dots. And you can see by the end of March, and you, you can get a copy of this slide and read all the detail for yourself. The important thing is by the end of March, those three clades had become one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least eight clades, eight different strains that have similar mutations. Not the same, but similar. And they were all over the world by then. Every island in the South Pacific, every place you wanted to look, they'd infected over 200 countries by the end of March. And we can pinpoint because you can see on the right side over here that they actually sequenced the grand princess infectious agent. And even Iran sequenced and had its own clade by the end of March. And as you might imagine, if this is what happened by the end of March, think of how many mutations have occurred and accumulated in a virus that can infect a human by the end of December. And last time I talked about five main ones, but the two that are most important these days are the South African one and the one that infected Southeast England. And the interesting thing about those two strains is that the thing that's important about them is they both have the same mutation in the spike protein. But those two strains, the South African and the one from the UK arose independently because they have one other mutation a, a deletion at 6970, which occurs in one of those uh, strains and not in the other one. 
And that's one of the ways we know they were developed independently. Next slide. Now I'm gonna switch topics completely to give you some idea of what to expect from COVID-19. And I'm gonna use the annual flu virus as the model. So the annual flu virus has been around in humans for a long time. Nobody knows exactly how long, but it was actually first described in the 1500s in the English literature, all right? So it's had a long time to adapt to humans. And this is what happened in the past decade in the United States. You can see that there's a different number of annual cases from a low in 2011-12 season of only 9 million cases approximately and about 12,000 deaths to the one at the end over here, which is the last year for which there was data, 2017-18 season, 45 million cases, 61,000 deaths, a total of over 800,000 hospitalizations, which is why we know these were all flu cases. And most of those deaths occurred in people in hospitals. Next slide. So why does this variation from year to year happen? So look at the question at the bottom of your slide, the factors that affect the number of annual cases. First of all, the characteristics of the flu strain itself, which determines infectivity and virulence. And those change from year to year, as you'll see at the other, the top part of the of this slide. There can also be big changes. Originally, annual flu in humans in the United States was a particular strain of porcine influenza virus. The one in 2017-18 were two different strains of porcine virus, plus of all things, and these are the main ones, there's lots of other little strains mixed in, but these were the main ones. A seal influenza B virus that crossed over to humans and got mixed in with the porcine. Now, how the hell the flu virus went from a pig to a seal or vice versa, I don't, want to know <laughs> but it happened you know in that time frame all right so that's one thing that can affect it the second one is the time of crossover to humans because each of these strains starts out in an animal like a seal and then jumps to humans in order to cause problems usually that happens somewhere else in the world and so there's a time to reach the United States, which is also involved in when and how seriously we get the flu virus. Now, one of the problems is the flu virus is developing reservoirs in the United States, so it doesn't have to travel from someplace else. And then finally, we have a vaccine each year and that vaccine effectiveness changes from time to time. And so does the percent of the population in the US that gets vaccinated in that season. And one of the reasons that affects vaccine effectiveness is you have to guess what these strains of flu virus are going to be. And it, because the it's a conventional virus that we get. So it's injecting eggs and incubating the virus in eggs and all of this kind of thing in order to get us to a vaccine. But that vaccine to get a couple million, hundreds of millions of doses for the US has to be prepared far in advance of the actual season 
So we're guessing which of the strains of virus are going to reach the U.S. And we don't know for sure. And then the other problem, of course, is that fewer and fewer people are getting vaccinated because of the anti-vaxxer movement. And so the annual vaccine program is becoming less effective. Now let's look at the top one, because this was another lie that was spread by our erstwhile president. Why is the flu seasonal? And the answer is not because warm weather kills the virus. Warm weather does affect how efficiently the virus is transferred through the air from person to person. But that's a relatively minor effect. And actually, cold weather is better for transmission than warm weather, but that's a property of the atmosphere, not of the virus. So usually annual flu, as I said, begins as a viral infection in a host reservoir. Until very recently, and especially starting in the 1950s, when we started to track these things in earnest, that reservoir was the Chinese pig population. Lots of pigs in China. They all have the flu virus. The flu virus turns around by mechanisms I'll show you in a minute, and a new strain infects the pig virus. The pigs carrying the annual, the new annual virus strain come to market in the fall and people eat them. Flu jumps to the people. So the virus starts spreading around the world in people. The human population gradually develops immunity to that annual strain. By the end of the summer, Immunity is so widespread that transmission of the flu virus drops below sustainable levels. And the season ends. Not because it got warm, but because everybody got immune. Meanwhile, the virus strain is in the Chinese pig reservoir and it continues to change. And the next fall, when the new crop of pigs carrying the new strain of the virus comes to market, the whole cycle changes and starts again. Now, the key to all of this is why is the annual flu strain different from year to year? So the next slide, please. Well, as I showed on an earlier slide, the influenza A virus mutates like crazy. And so what happens is you've got the H3N3 strain in this infected pigs. It's mutating and mutating and mutating. And there are so many infected pigs and the mutation rate is so high that eventually a new strain emerges and starts spreading through the pig population. And so what you have when the new crop of pigs comes to market is a new flu strain. And so that's the major way the flu virus changes from season to season. Now, you've heard rumors that even though the COVID virus has these new mutations, the spike protein hasn't changed and we don't have to worry that the vaccines based on the old spike protein sequence are still good for the new one. What's different about the flu virus? Why are mutations important and can change the flu virus so easily while the COVID virus people aren't as worried about, even though the COVID virus has a higher mutation rate? Next slide. 
this is the way the flu virus enters and exits our cell. So here's the flu virus. It's a genome surrounded by its capsid, surrounded by an envelope, no envelope rather. So it's just a naked capsid. And here is the way it attaches to the human cell. Here is its spike protein. It's a hemagglutinin. But if you look over here in the right panel, I'm pointing with my pointer on my computer and I have no idea whether you can see that or not. And I apologize for that. But in any event, if you look at the orange thing on the right panel, that hemagglutinin is a trimer. And so it's a very, very complicated spike. The problem is the active sites are buried inside that top of the spike. And it's that active site that actually does the binding to the host cell, part of our respiratory system. And what has to happen with the flu virus vaccine or our natural immunity is we have to develop antibodies to all as many of these active sites, these little circles around the orange, the greenish ellipses in the center that we can so that that active site in the middle gets blocked and the flu virus can't attach to the human cell. The second issue is there's something called an NA, a neuroaminidase spike on the outside of the virus. That's the way the virus copies leave the human cell after they've replicated. They don't just go and pop out into the air or into the rest of our system. They get stuck on the blue site by the little active site circle and ellipse in the center. And there's actually a special enzyme that comes along and clips off that receptor on the virus so that the cell can be released, the virus can be released. And so we need to block that one too, because we don't have to block that one, but we should block that one. All right, so here you have a very complicated mechanism and you have all of these different places on the spike protein of the flu virus. And if any or some of these little circles around the active site of that spike mutate, and it's fairly easy for them to mutate, you end up with a virus that our antibodies don't recognize anymore and can't block. So the virus still works, but our antibodies don't. And that's why we get an annual strain. This is a mechanism that doesn't happen very easily in the coronavirus, thank goodness. It can happen, but in the coronavirus, most of the spike mutations that we see are in this bottom part of the spike, not in the very top that attaches itself to the cell. But that mutation in the South African and English virus, that one is in the very top of the spike, which is why people are worried. And that's why it sticks to human cells better, which is why it's more easily transmitted. It doesn't take as many particles floating in the air to infect us. Next slide. 
All right, so the flu virus can undergo another mechanism called antigenic shift. Mutation is called antigenic drift. This is antigenic shift, but it's easier to think of it as genomic mixing. And a lot of times that's the way it's referred to. And so basically what you have is mixing of genomes between different species. And so in this case, there is also a huge goose and duck Chinese population. And they have H1N1 infections, which can transfer to pigs. And so what you end up with is a combination of the duck and the pig. They get mixed together and you end up with a new H1N1 that infects humans. And you remember the serious outbreak that we had in that last year was because of not only the pure pig strain, but also this mixed strain between birds and pigs. And so you've got a second mechanism that's also messing up our ability to make a vaccine and predict what we're gonna become infected with each year. Next slide. Now, this mixing problem can be very important because in 1915, this process created an admixture of H1N1 that turned out to be the Spanish flu. And that's what infected a third of the world's population and killed 50 million people over, over a period of three years. And this kind of mixing between birds and pigs has occurred a number of times since, and there was an outbreak in 1957, and there was another one in 1968. And these were from different viruses that also did this genomic mixing and ended up in humans. And next slide, and I think this is the last one, for all of you who are falling asleep. Um, this is another set. In 1997, a common bird virus became a species admixture and a new strain crossed over to humans and that was the bird flu. That one was nipped in the bud pretty early, but then it reemerged in 2005 because it had a reservoir and it never really went away. And that one became a worldwide outbreak. And there have been a number of other outbreaks due to this genomic mixing. And I've listed a number of the important ones here. And the most important recent one is this 2013 one and another totally different strain of bird virus common got genomically mixed but and infected humans, but fortunately didn't kill people. But this same process can lead to pathogens that affect other species that are important to us. And so in the 1990s, a pig virus killed birds worldwide. And in 2015, it, infected chickens and 43 million chickens in the US had to be destroyed to prevent the pandemic from spreading to all birds everywhere. And I think that's the last slide. Next next slide, Lou, I don't remember for sure, I'm tired. Uh, oh yeah, I've tried it, it has, there is no next slide. Thank okay. You. Thank so you. This, 
Oh, wait, All a right. oh wait, there is. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's, there's this one. Uh, people last time asked me about this particular question, or at least I brought it up. In the early stages of the outbreak in China, how did the Chinese know that they were dealing with infected patients that had a new virus? So first of all, there were clinical symptoms. They actually had all sorts of tests for RNA virus because of the flu and other coronaviruses. They found out it wasn't them. And then they did a chest CT scan just to be sure. And you can see all of this cloudy area, infected cloudy areas in human patients. And so that was their positive test for a new virus. Negative test for RNA, positive test for uh, infected lungs. And then after the sequence was identified, because it had hit China, the Chinese had a PCR <laughs> test for the SARS virus, COVID-1, and that was already available to them. And they recognized that the ORF1 area in the two viruses was the same. And so they substituted the SARS PCR test for step two above instead of that RNA virus test, but they still use the CT scan of the lungs for confirmation until they actually had a COVID-2 specific PCR test available. And so you don't have to rely on PCR tests. It's just supposedly easier and faster, and it's definitely a lot cheaper. All right, and that is definitely the last slide. So if anybody's still awake and with us, I'll be happy to try to answer questions. I think Piawi had a question. Um, uh, the first one is about the disease X, which is, you know, uh, which just happened uh, or was on the news a couple of days ago, wondering what you know about this new disease. But another question, uh, I- The answer to that one is I don't know anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> another, another thing that I would like to know, uh, you talked about the flu thing and then you said it, uh, it's not because of the weather, but um, uh, it's um, kind of time to travel to the US. So my question is the way you presented, it seems to me that uh, the chance of uh, the spillover or the cause that you know happened from the animal to human in United States kind of slim or you know not much chance. Why is that? Well, uh, so in answer to your question, um, the crossover in the early days, like in the 50s, happened in China from pigs to humans. And once it was in humans, it started to spread around the world, the new strain, the annual strain. But it still took some time to infect a significant population in the US and cause the outbreak. But that still happened in the fall. It just didn't happen as early in the fall as it happened, for example, in China, right? But especially in the early days, um, Chinese pork was imported in large quantities into the US. One of the reasons there's such a large pig farm industry in the US was to try to slow down the transfer into humans in the US. But what's ended up happening is now those pigs are getting infected. And so instead of having to get a new strain from China, we're getting a new strain from our own pigs. 
Now, fortunately, we don't have the big duck and goose population the way it occurs in Vietnam and China and a lot of the rest of Southeast Asia. And so we don't have to worry as often about domestic genomic mixing between a bird flu and a pig flu, for example. But it can still happen and get to us if it's very transmissible from human to human. And the thing about the Spanish flu was actually that I, that outbreak didn't occur in Spain. The start of the outbreak was here in the U.S., I think in Kansas, wasn't it? Yeah. They, yeah. So that was a domestic one, even though we call it Spain. <laughs> Don't ask me why. All right, so did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Steve, and, quick, quick question. Is there some yeah. strat strategy to vaccinate domestic animals that we could come up with uh, proactively that would reduce the, the transmission in humans if we could get rid of it in the animal populations, domestic animals? Yeah, but uh, in general, we'd have to do the same thing in the animals as we're doing in humans. We'd have to vaccinate them every year. And for sure, we wouldn't know what they have. I mean, it's the time lag from in the old, like in the 50s, when we started following all of this and producing effective flu vaccines, it's the time lag from identifying a new strain in China because the Chinese were getting sick, right? And they had immunity just like we had in the US to the previous strain. And so you identify what strain is happening in China and that's what you prepare your vaccine against. But now we've got our own reservoirs and we're starting to get crossover, I mean, we don't think of annual flu as influenza B, we think of it as influenza A only. But that bad year we had, that one had seal influenza B, which is very closely related and uses a similar entry and exit mechanism, but still has to be blocked by antibodies or people get sick. And the problem is that most of the flu virus strains, the old ones, are spread worldwide and have human reservoirs. Mm. And so they exist in the human population all the time, just like those COVID viruses I showed you, the four that mostly call com cause common colds. You know, in fact, a friend of mine back in February, had a respiratory disease, and he's like 80 something, I can't remember how old Chris is exactly. But he lived in Philadelphia, fortunately, and had really good contacts with the medical center at Temple. And he got really sick. And they didn't know what was wrong with him because this was before the official start of the pandemic. So first they thought he had the flu. And so they tested for flu. And it turns out that in this country, we have a single test for influenza A and for COVIDs, the four strains of COVID. And so you can do one PCR test that says, are any of these positive? And then you pick the one you think is most likely and you test for it. And so we know Chris was one of the earliest COVID-19 cases in the Philadelphia area because all of those tests for the flu and the other COVID viruses were negative. So he had a new one that mimicked the symptoms of all those other things. And fortunately, he didn't die, but he was hospitalized for quite a while. And this was before they had any clue about what to do. 
and everything was breaking loose in New York and New Jersey, but not in Pennsylvania. How he got it, nobody really knows. I mean, he lives in a on the top floor of a high rise in Philadelphia, in downtown Philadelphia. But uh, he and his wife are very active and go all over the place and in downtown Philly and eat at all sorts of restaurants and things like that on a regular basis. So if it was in Philly, he got it. <laughs> so the answer is it's really impractical to vaccinate animals. You might as well wait and vaccinate, vaccinate. the human. <laughs> yes, question? Uh, I, I have a question. I didn't ask it right the last time. Now you've given me the phrase genomic mixing, which is... Uh, uh, yeah, you didn't know that phrase last time either, so it's, it's okay. Well, yeah, so um, my concern is uh, COVID grows exponentially, which it, uh, maybe our next outbreak is going to be from all of the rioters in D.C. Uh, <laughs> As it grows, okay. so you're saying it spreads exponentially. It spreads exponentially. Yes, yeah. so we don't need any COVID three feet across. Okay, as it, <laughs> spreads, as it spreads exponentially, I would assume that uh, the rate at which we get mutations is in some way a function of the number of people that have it, an increasing function of the number of people that have it, and. Uh, so we have different mutations occurring among different people. And if there is genomic mixing, first, if, if there's a lot of infections around, the chance of a person getting two different COVID infections goes up by the square, I think. And the chance that two of those different infections genomically mixing to a third infection goes up as well. And so at some point we might find best of breed or worst of breed from my viewpoint, COVID's emerging faster as more people are infected. Well, and, and in fact, that's exactly what's happening. And it's, it's really mutation rates, not genomic mixing, that's the problem with this. And that's, why we suddenly have a South African strain, which is so much more virulent and easy to transfer from people to people. And the same thing is true of the UK strain. Lots and lots of, lots and lots more people infected, lots and lots more accumulation of mutations. We finally got one or the virus finally found one that allows it to infect more people faster. And so the UK strain, people think these days, instead of infecting maybe two to three people each cycle, if there are lots of people around it, it will infect up between five and eight. And right. so that's one of the reasons it's spreading faster. Right, now, now what I'm saying is this is the past, past is prologue. What I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is if, let's say that the UK strain and the South African strain are two different strains and that if they genomically mix, we might get versions of the virus that have both of their advantages. And so the more people that these advantages are, for the virus are developing in, the more chances we're going to have that they're going to additively get much worse. Maybe it's one, it is incompatible with the other, but there might be mutations that are compatible between two different strains. Yeah, genomic mixing of two different strains of COVID, two groups of, of viruses that have different mutations can mix together because one human gets both infections. Exactly. That's possible, but it's really hard to tell the difference between why a group of mutations accumulates. Is it because one mutation or one strain 
spent a lot of time mutating and here's the new one? Or is it because strains in one person mixed together, which looks the same at the end, it looks like a strain with a lot of mutations, right? And then that spreads. And it, you can't tell a difference between those two results. You might be able to tell by the rate. In other words, uh, it, okay. I, I don't think so because the mutation rate is so much higher than the genomic mixing rate. Okay. Right, you have to have people with infections from both viruses, both right. kinds of viruses. But and that's, that, that goes up as the square. Yeah, that right. will certainly become more important as more people get infected, but it's probably not that important yet right. compared to plain old ordinary mutation. Yeah. All right, so I finally understand your question and how to answer it properly. Okay. One of the reasons I'm giving this talk is because of your question last time where the subject of genomic mixing came up and I didn't have a good way to explain it to you. <laughs> so I said, all right, that's part of my basic talk. I'll give that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, it, it's obvious that something like that could happen with, uh, given the way COVID is constructed and then it works in sort of cassettes of eight different uh, gene sets as I understand it. But, but the point is that uh, we, uh, for humanity's sake, we don't want it we don't want a, lot of, want a lot of people infected, but for our own selfish sake, we don't want COVID to get, shall we say, better at uh, 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 improving itself. Well, we're never gonna we're never gonna stop it because there will always be a human reservoir somewhere in the world. It's impossible to vaccinate once, let alone possibly every year, because there's no reason to think that eventually, if there are enough strains around the world, suddenly a new strain will emerge that will escape the vaccine we have, and we'll have to start the cycle all over again, or even more likely, just like the COVID viruses that are persistent in the population, the immunity we develop won't last. And we do develop immunity to those COVID viruses that cause the common cold, but that immunity only lasts at most two years and usually less than one. COVID finds a way to escape just the way the flu virus does. It just escapes more slowly. Agreed. I. Uh... I, I uh, saw the Bill Gates's uh, presentations uh, early this year or early last year, where you know first first the ones from years ago where he was talking about oh uh, yeah the TED talk prepared, and I I imagine this sort of idealized world where we say we don't need to let's stop making nuclear bombs for a year and use all of that money to build Bill Gates's internet virus and yeah. science force. Well, we've had a pretty, we had a pretty good start, especially in the US, and then it got dismantled in 2018, which is why we we're so totally unprepared for this pandemic. Everybody predicted, including Gates in 2015, everybody predicted it was coming, but our fearless leader decided it wasn't gonna come. Right, sure. And, and I've been preparing for 15 years for this. So right, <laughs> not the United right. States. But you brought up you brought up a point, Lou. Is Lou around? Yep, I'm here. All right, I had sent you a single slide. Remember oh, that? Yeah, I yeah. got Wait, it somewhere. Yeah, it, I think it's called Other Vaccine or something like that, a really small file. I think I got it. All right. I do have one more slide that's sort of a follow-up to the 
previous talk that I gave, again, an answer to somebody's question. And I don't know if he's with us today or not, but this is it. Um, somebody asked me or told me about some of the other <clears throat> vaccines, especially international ones that have been developed or are almost completely developed. And so this is a brief look at those other vaccines. And a lot of these are gonna be used in the third world in particular, because they're extremely cheap to manufacture. So the first one that's being used in certain countries around the world is a Chinese vaccine from Sinovac. <clears throat> it needs two doses, but it can be stored at basically refrigeration temperature as long as necessary. And it's the one that somebody last time was talking about that's been approved for use in Bahrain and the UAE. Now, the thing to see when you look at all of these from China is especially the ones from Sinovac and from Sinopharm, which is the state-owned pharmaceutical company, all of those are inactivated whole coronavirus. So conventional viruses where you take the live virus and you treat it, in most cases listed, you treat it with hydroxide to inactivate it so it can't infect people, but it's still left intact. And then you give that dead virus, hopefully dead virus, <laughs> to people as a vaccine. And that's the way most conventional viruses are made, or especially used to be made in the old days. So it's easy and cheap, especially if you got a lot of eggs, like from that huge duck and goose population. <laughs> no, but the point is, there's no way in hell you could convince anybody in the U.S. to take that kind of virus. Because you got to make sure that the virus is dead and can't infect people on its own. The only thing it can do is create immunity. And that's a really hard thing to do with a virus like COVID. The CanSino is essentially a Chinese biotech, but they're still using a fragment of the actual virus. And so again, hopefully, they have fragmented the virus and purified the fragment that has the spike protein, but there's none of the whole virus around when they're done. Or again, you give someone a shot and basically you're in infecting them. So that kind of virus, which is the Chinese approach, one, it's fast and dirty, but two, it's potentially very dangerous. On the other hand, there are orders for these viruses all over the world because the Chinese are making them extremely cheaply and available extremely cheaply or for free to countries like in Africa where they're interested in developing an economic influence. So they're using their viruses as a political tool. The other thing about them is they've all done clinical trials, but the only one that I could find that has done anything close to a decent trial is the one from Wuhan Institute that was developed by the Wuhan Institute that first identified the COVID-19 virus. And that one is undergoing a very large phase three clinical trial in Bahrain. So that's the only one that I've seen that has what I would call a decent sized 
phase three clinical trial. Although no details and no data, no details about the structure of the trial and no details about the data from the trial have been released as far as I can tell. So only the Chinese know how safe and effective it is. And they're not telling. Another vaccine that's been a, approved for use is one developed in Russia with support from the Ministry of Health. I have no idea who this research institute is. I've never heard of it before. But its vaccine is named Sputnik V. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a two-dose vaccine, but again, it can be stored at refrigerated temperature. It underwent a very large phase three trial. It's actually been approved for use on an emergency basis in Russia, and it's being given to people in Russia, but it can't be given to people over 65, and it can't be given to people under 18. And again, no information about the structure of the trial or data from the trial. The good news is that it actually uses biotechnology. And what it is, is an adenovirus vector. That's the way the vaccine gets produced and introduced, but the DNA of the adenovirus has been modified so that it produces the spike protein. The adenovirus produces the spike protein and the adenovirus infectivity has been killed. And that's a, a totally recombinant adenovirus, so it should be safe. Again, no idea how effective it is, but supposedly Russia has orders from 50 third world countries for it. And again, the Russians are using it to generate political influence in Africa and the Middle East. Isn't that then, quite a lot less effective than uh, the one uh, uh, that we have? The only information about effectiveness from either the Chinese, but especially the Russian vaccine, the Chinese are saying that their vaccines are somewhere around 80-ish to maybe as high as 90% effective. The Russians have done their clinical trials in several different countries. And just like the AstraZeneca vaccine had problems with different effectiveness results from different countries, the Russians had the same problems. And they had a spread from like supposedly 50% up into the 80th percent effectiveness range. So a decent vaccine, because our standard for a good vaccine is at least 50% effective. So these vaccines, if the data hold true, would be approvable by our CDC and FDA. So in that sense, they're great. But most of the Chinese clinical trials were done, especially the one that they started using very early in China itself, were done on less than a thousand people. So you really can't get any decent statistics from that as far as how effective the vaccine is. You know, most of the good clinical trials for the vaccines that have been approved in the US are 30 to 50,000 people. And the data from those is marginal on how good the vaccine is and useful only because the vaccine is very good. You start getting to the 50% effective, you got to have an awful lot of sick people 
and therefore you have to have an awful lot of people in the trial before you can get decent statistics to know that you have a 50 or 60% effective vaccine. In any event, there are a couple of other um, vaccines floating around. A couple of them have some merit. Novavax is a biotech in Maryland. The DOD is supporting that vaccine development and it's got warp speed dollars behind it, especially for the clinical trials. And it's a recombinant COVID protein, so the spike, and somehow they have turned it into a nanoparticle. And so it's got a lot of little pieces sticking on to something at its core. And so you produce not just one piece with one spike, you produce lots of spikes attached to, to a central core. They also have a proprietary adjuvant, which is supposed to make the vaccine more effective. But that one's only in stage two clinical trials, late stage two. But that one, you know, it's got the DOD behind it. And so it should have a pretty decent clinical trial by the time they're done, if it's any good. And then one that's actually very close is a vaccine developed by Janssen uh, with support from J&J. &J. And then BARDA kicked in dollars for the early stage clinical trials. And that one is in stage three clinicals. And it's also a recombinant adenovirus vector that's been modified to produce the spike protein. And it's got a very good clinical trial, 45,000 participants. So that's the same size as the Pfizer trial. Because again, Janssen and J&J &J know how to produce vaccines and do clinical trials for them. And then finally, India, even though it's using external vaccines, has also, with one of its biotechs, developed its own vaccine. And that one, again, is an inactivated whole virus. So that one's pretty scary, but that one's already being used internally in India. And there are a number of others, but they're all in much earlier stages at most phase two clinical trials, so far from coming to market. And most of the ones that are in that stage are modified adenovirus vector types. Because that's, again, a fairly simple way to produce a lot of vaccine once you know it works and a very cheap way to do it. All right, so that is definitely the last slide. And that also I produced to answer some of the questions I was getting from our my last talk. All right, have we still got people on the Zoom? I'm amazed. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought I'd bored everybody to death by now. <laughs> We're moving hey, around. An, another question from somebody? I was a little curious about uh, the pigs in the US. Uh, so you say that they are starting to, you know, be the vectors for the the flu virus. Do they? Is it the same sort of seasonal thing as the pigs in no. China? Or? No. How, how, how does that affect the seasonality of it? Well, the problem is those pigs are constantly coming to market, so they yeah. all come. Okay. There isn't a new crop. The whole idea of the US farms is they are constantly producing piglets. And so those piglets are constantly maturing to the point where they can be slaughtered and sold at different times of the year. And they all are gonna be infected if any of them in a farm are infected. And they're gonna have a strain. 
you know, because just like the virus tr transfers from pigs to humans, it transfers from humans back to pigs. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so sure. if humans are infected. Pigs on those farms are going to be infected. So we're going to end up having a more of a year round uh, food and, and, uh, and that, situation. In and the that's US. basically what's happening. And then the only seasonal variation you will see is the ease of transmission of virus in cold versus warm weather because of how well droplets can be transmitted through cold air versus through warm air. And that's going to be the only seasonal variation. And pretty and soon, it's going to be a year-round virus, just like a lot of the other viruses we get. And none of these pigs show any symptoms, so you can't tell ahead of time? Or, yeah, you got it. That's a thick pig. <laughs> the, the pigs are just a host. It's just like that mite was a host for that deformed wing virus. You know, or cats are hosts to the feline leukemia virus. Yep. You know, or dogs or dogs are hosts. They get a little ill, but they don't die from it. And that's really what worries us. I mean, the, if all the flu virus did was make us sick, who cares? But it kills it. Get <laughs> yeah, it, it hospitalizes tens of thousands of people to hundreds of thousands of people, and it kills tens of thousands of people. So we care about it and we try to do something about it. But we don't develop vaccines against rhinovirus, the ones that give us common colds, but really don't give us anything more serious, unless a new rhinovirus strain develops. And then we work like hell to get rid of it. We isolate that population, and we stop transmission of that particular strain. And how do we do it? Through testing and contact tracing, just the way all the public health experts say we should have done it with COVID-19 virus from the beginning, because we already do it for other viruses. But the pigs, the bats, the ducks, they never get the sniffles. You got it. Huh. I mean, and, oh, I take that back. They do because the virus mutates in them and eventually the virus gets to the point where it has the ability to kill the host, right? And so bats do die, but usually that strain doesn't spread because it's usually not from bat to bat transmission. You know, it does get transmitted from bats to bats, but most of the time, those transmissions, in a lot of cases, require a vector, usually an insect vector, like in the case of Zika virus. I mean, Zika virus is a virus that infects animals. And who cares? Because it doesn't kill them. But if a mosquito bites one of those animals and then bites us, we don't have any innate immunity to the Zika virus. We get very sick and some of us die, which is why Zika in the South became such a problem that we're still worried about. Because as the mosquitoes move, so does the virus and people start dying, even though it started in Southern Florida. It's traveled all the way across and it's in Texas, and I really haven't kept track of it, but that it's still here. Related to climate change, then. Oh, yeah, and, and that's another factor that's spreading viruses in this country that have insect vectors, like the arbor viruses in particular. And even if they don't affect us, they can start affecting animals. And Zika is a particular case because while there are a lot of different kinds of mosquitoes, there's only one kind of mosquito that's a host for Zika. And so where that mosquito goes is where people get infected, 
not just where all mosquitoes go. And that's the good news. <laughs> I think it actually, I'm trying to remember as I'm talking, it might actually be three different kinds of mosquitoes. But there are dozens of kinds of mosquitoes in the U.S. And it's only a very few species that are important in some of these transmissions. Anyhow, any other questions? Because I'm going to collapse on my computer screen here pretty soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, well, first, first, I uh, want to point out that there's a book that I like and an associated website called uh, Cell Biology by the Numbers that teaches engineers like me how a lot of the uh, molecular biology works. And associated with that, they have COVID by the numbers on the website. So they have this four page information dense poster which has hundreds of references and numbers and that sort of thing for COVID. So it's a useful thing for people to ask questions when you're not around. Yeah, and there actually, there are lots and lots. I didn't draw any of the figures. And so as you can tell, all of the information that I presented in these last two talks have been gleaned from the internet, right? The figure. Yeah. So if you know how to search the scientific literature, don't depend on websites like, you know, WebMD or anything like that. But if you know how to search the scientific literature and you continuously do it, which I don't do as often as I used to, you can pretty much keep up these days on any subject in biology. Yeah, you can usually ladder up and down the citations to find all sorts of things. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, if, the real problem is if you don't have a background and a vocabulary, you can't understand the scientific literature. Well, so, that's, what, I mean, that's what the book I suggested comes in. Uh, but I, a question I couldn't get answered from that poster and I haven't been able to find with my ladder searches is uh, we know that uh, COVID uh, lasts longer in the cold. And as near as I can tell, just linear graph it, uh, an 11 degrees centigrade colder makes it last twice as long. Uh, you know, deactivating on a surface, on the packages, on metal, on whatever, you can go from the yeah, rig. Yeah. Well, we had, uh, what we started doing like last March is when incoming packages come in, they stay in the garage for four days. And we disinfect things that we act, uh, need right away, but you don't want to do that with some things like lettuce. <laughs> you wash that and you hope. But in any case, now it's winter. And the garage isn't uh, 70 or 80 or 90 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit out there. It's uh, 50 Fahrenheit. And so I'm wondering whether we're, uh, you know, we should be, it's, it's like a factor of two in 10 hours on. Yeah, uh, I mean, look up the Arrhenius equation. Oh, absolutely. And so we can say that from that, the activation energy is about an electron volt. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's the way, for example, when pharmaceutical companies do um, temperature storage as a question, how should we store and how long can we store our drug? Or in this case, how long can we store our vaccine? You know, the answer might be that at minus 80, the Pfizer vaccine is good for a year, but you don't wait a year to find that out. What you do is you study what happens at minus 50, at minus 30, at minus 10, and then you use the Arrhenius equation to extrapolate what should happen at minus 80. And, and can we? And that's the way they're all done. Can we assume that it's one rate constant for uh, COVID, and, or might there be a crossover where at freezing it lasts a lot longer or something? Yeah, well, the real problem that you're bringing up is that there can be more than one way 
a, a material, whatever it is, a drug, a vaccine, whatever it is, there might be more than one way temperature destroys it. It may be that as you warm up a material that had one method of falling apart at low temperatures, suddenly a new temperature or a new process for falling apart shows up at a slightly higher temperature. And then all of your Arrhenius um, extrapolations don't work at all, <laughs> obviously, because you know, you pick the wrong temperature range to test it. Right, and I'm wondering whether there's any kinks down below. In any case, for winter, we're probably gonna build a heated cage in the garage so that we can, uh, the stuff can decay a little bit faster. And then again, we use disinfectant on what we can. Well, I, I'm not going to discourage you, <laughs> but I don't, I don't do that as thoroughly as you. <laughs> and I don't feel uncomfortable with my result. I just leave my packages, if the small ones delivered by the post office, I leave them in the mailbox for a couple of days before I pick them up. You know, uh, you know, I'll wait, for example, from the end of the week, I'll wait through a Sunday and pick them up on a Monday or something like that. I don't go to the mailbox every day. I, I wait. And then when I do pick up the mail, I pick it up before the time the mailman comes to deliver the mail that day. So my mailman usually comes somewhere between 12 and one. So I'll pick it up at, you know, somewhere before that, like at 10 to be safe. Uh -huh. And so I'm doing the same thing as you. And I put packages in my garage, but I mean, what do you do about uh, produce and other stuff from the supermarket? Yeah, it, well, I, I treat it as a numbers game. I come out of semiconductors where one thing, a tenth of the size of a COVID particle can destroy a $300 microprocessor. So, uh, you know, I think of operating rooms as uh, cesspools compared to what we have to do in the fab. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But what you've got to think about is even under the best of circumstances, most of the stuff I mean, the supermarket doesn't make it. It gets made somewhere else or grown somewhere else and then stuck in a big box. And then it gets to the supermarket and it takes at least 24 to 48 hours before that new material ends up on the supermarket shelf. Unless you have a really big supermarket with really fast turnover that gets deliveries of produce like twice a day or something. And I'm some of the really big ones do, but most of them don't. Most of the time, the produce that you're worried about has already been sitting around at room temperature or refrigeration temperature for days. To be juggled and, by the customer who uh, handled it and uh, see, saw yeah, how- Yeah, I mean, so yes. there is, the one but I as work. long as you live in a low transmission state with low positivity rates, like Oregon, I mean, Oregon still has like, what is it these days? David, you probably keep closer track than I do, but it usually runs around 6%. So at most about 6% of the population, a little higher from Multnomah County, has COVID. And so the likelihood that one of those people is going to transmit their virus in sufficient quantities to your produce or your box on the supermarket shelf, and then you're gonna come along if it's a box quickly enough to pick up that specific box that was contaminated by that specific person, the odds are pretty low you're much more likely to get it from person to person transmission somewhere else. Right, and I presume those people aren't shopping at New Seasons. They might be shopping at uh, Fred Meyer. <laughs> yeah, and if you notice, most of the big supermarkets are very good about making sure 
that their people for the bulk shelf stocking, their people are masked and wearing gloves. And they disinfect like crazy. You would not believe how much disinfecting goes on behind the scenes, especially in places where there's rapid turnover or restocking on a daily basis. Yeah, again, I worry about the customers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like I said, if I lived someplace where the positivity rate was 25%, like North Dakota, I mean, I would travel out of state to buy my stuff. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't buy anything off the shelf. I mean, <laughs> you know, so there's always going to be risk no matter how much you protect yourself. It's like, unfortunately, my oldest son and his family, they did really well. But just before they were due to be vaccinated, uh, my oldest son and my granddaughter and one of my grandsons all got COVID. Uh, my daughter-in-law was already vaccinated because she's a, she works clinically, even though she's a psychologist, she's in the hospital. So she's a frontline worker, but the rest of the family didn't. And so the real question they live in Alabama. The positivity rate is 15%. They're fanatics because I yell at them all the time, as I do to all my kids about taking precautions. And yet, and my grandkids play sports. And so my grandsons traveled all over the South to baseball tournaments because they're both stars, age group stars you know, and they play on the national teams and things like that. And my granddaughter is in her late teens, but she's a, so a soccer phenom. And again, she goes to the Olympic training camps and things like that, even though she's, well, she's 17 now. Uh, but in any event, they traveled all over to all of these tournaments and I was absolutely panicked because I traveled with them to some of these tournaments when I visited during the summer. And they didn't get it from that. And so the real question is, and my son works from home. So the real question is, how the hell did the family get it? Might be the, and the likely, shores, No, the likelihood is, my, especially the younger son who has it, he goes to school on a split schedule. So he has in-person learning three days a week. And then the next week, it's two days a week. But the likelihood is he got infected in school and brought it home. And so the real question is, you know, how good are school? being protected. Now it's Alabama, but he goes to a really good Alabama school because the community has lots and lots of money. So what they do in that school is not typical of rural Alabama or someplace like that. And the positivity rate for the community is lower than the state in total, but it's still higher than Oregon, for example. And so my guess is that's where it happened. And so if you have grandkids, don't let them near you. <laughs> I'm, reminded of the, I'm reminded of the Tom Lehrer song, I got it from Agnes. So maybe it was Agnes. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, the point is, even though you're careful, it can still happen. And I have many, many friends with many, many stories who say they're fanatics and yet somehow end up COVID positive. 